Childhood and horror, they are intrinsically linked. And that is what this episode of History of Horror is about. Children in horror films. But not all kids. This episode focuses on kids like little Danny here. The heroes, the protagonists, the good kids. The creepy kids will have their own episode due out after this one. So, let's focus on Danny. And not on these two freaky bastards and others like them. Specifically, this episode of History of Horror seeks to explore horror films that primarily tell their stories from the point of view of a child. When I started looking into this topic, I found fewer films to talk about than I expected. Why was that? Why is the perspective of the child protagonist so rare in classic horror cinema? Until fairly recently, horror films and superhero movies were dismissed as kids' fare. They often starred adults, sometimes brave and strong, and sometimes silly and childlike. So many of us discover our love of horror during our formative years. Thus they'd make horror films for kids and teens. But the more interesting horror films about children are, in my opinion, the films that tell horror stories for adults but that take a child's point of view. So let's explore the child protagonist's perspective in adult horror cinema, and why it is rare, despite being incredibly effective. The first question we must ask is, what is a child? Would it surprise you to know that we're still figuring this out? Sure, sure, a child is a person who hasn't yet grown up. They tend to be short of stature, quick to cry, addicted to sugar, and just a little bit naive. But that's only scratching the surface. To understand, we must go deeper. For children, the world is relatively new. They have yet to become cynical. And they are experiencing many things for the first time. Things we adults take for granted. Things we have forgotten that were once new and thrilling and dangerous. The child's sense of a new experience comes with the baggage of trying to understand it and contextualize it. What does this experience mean? How does it change my world? Why is the world like this? To reflect on new experiences requires a very active way of thinking and of sensing the world. Being new to something actually alters the brain's chemistry, and thus the child experiences the world differently than an adult in a similar situation. For instance, did you ever wonder why time seems to move faster the older you get? One theory is that time only seems to move faster because there are less new experiences to process. Processing new experiences slows our perception of time. But if something is routine to us, then our sense of time is sped up. So the less new experiences we have, the faster time moves. Seriously, if you ever meet, or lucky you, have a baby of your own that is about six months old, study their eyes. See how they take in the world. Their eyes are wide open, as if they just can't get enough of the world, because it is all new, and it's all unknown, and it's all a bit frightening. And time stretches in order to take it all in. Most of us remember being young. We are often nostalgic about our childhood. We remember what it was like to experience our first time doing a whole bunch of different things. First journey away from our parents and out into the world. First kisses. First encounters with the terror of adulthood. Recent filmmakers and novelists seem to have figured out that if they explore a story through the eyes of a child, the audience will on the primal level regress to childhood. And at least if the film or book is any good, they'll experience it through a child's perspective. Stephen King is a master at capturing this point of view. 
One of Stephen King's greatest novels is the 1986 epic tome It. It was filmed first as a 1990 miniseries, starring the wonderful Tim Curry as Pennywise the Dancing Clown. The story takes place over a 27-year gap. It is set both in the 1980s and in the 1950s, following the same group of kids who face off with a demonic entity that is feeding on their fear. All the characters battle their childhood traumas, and even as adults, the story retains their childlike point of view, because despite growing up, they regress and retain the way they encounter the terror. They all only truly reach adulthood by conquering their fears, yet their childhood perspectives are instrumental in fighting off Pennywise and freeing themselves of the monster. The book, quite simply, is a masterful exploration of childhood versus adult psychology. The 1990 miniseries wasn't particularly strong, despite Tim Curry's incredible performance as Pennywise. <laughs> to be fair, it is hard to capture the complexities of a thousand-plus page novel in just three hours. When time came for a theatrical remake in 2017, the filmmakers dropped the adult angle, focusing only on the story of the children. They knew they couldn't keep all the complexities of the book. It simply wasn't possible to retain it all in a two-hour film. The filmmakers had to make brutal choices for the story, removing a lot of subtext, but the remake works remarkably well, and despite its reduced psychological complexity, what the filmmakers capture beautifully is the children's perspective. It was a runaway commercial success, grossing a staggering $700 million on a $35 million budget. This took a lot of people by surprise, but if we look closer at the 2017 version of It, we can see that it works so well for one reason. Simply put, it is one of only a few horror films through cinema history to truly capture the story through the eyes of children. But what happens when another Georgie goes missing? or another Betty, or another Ed Corcoran, or one of us. Are you just gonna pretend it isn't happening like everyone else in this town? Currently, there's a wave of nostalgia for the 1980s and the 1990s, when a lot of today's adults grew up, myself included. The film capitalizes on this, moving the past section of the book from the 50s to the 80s. That is also an explanation for the film's success, certainly. Everyone wants to capture the zeitgeist, but there is more to its success than simply coming out at the right time. The masterstroke of it is cutting the adult perspective entirely from the storytelling and committing fully to the point of view of the children. Every single scene is told from a child character's perspective. Every encounter with an adult is sinister. No adults will help. help! They all turn away or worse, they become threats themselves. This is a brilliant way for the filmmakers to bond us to the sense of fear the young characters experience, and it makes thematic sense exactly because of the nature of Pennywise, who literally feeds on the fears of children. By conquering their fears and reaching for adulthood, the child protagonists finally defeat the dancing clown at the end of the film. <laughs> Naturally, the stage is set for a sequel, one from the adult point of view of the novel. The sequel, It Chapter 2, was also a hit, but not a runaway success, like its predecessor. Somehow, with adult lead characters, Chapter 2 feels more like a traditional horror film. I genuinely liked it, but It Chapter 2 didn't have the same natural, elemental storytelling touch. The innocence of youth. And thus, it wasn't as scary. The first It isn't alone in using the point of view of children. You can probably think of a whole gaggle of horror films and TV shows from the 80s onwards that do the same. Chief among recent ones is the Netflix TV series Stranger Things. The series was heavily influenced by the works of Stephen King. Most Stranger Things fans I've talked to say they prefer the scenes with the children, instead of the ones with the teens or the adults. This despite the series being an ensemble with lots of highly compelling screen time given to all of its characters. And quite frankly, the adult actors are damn good too. In fact, 
The teenagers and the adults have equal sized parts to the children, but the perspective that seems the most riveting is the childhood one. Indeed, horror is often well served by being approached through the eyes of a child. So again I ask, why is it so rare to find older horror films that truly employ this point of view? Believe it or not, but the idea of childhood isn't as old as you think. There was a time not in the so distant past when children were viewed as miniature adults, and they were treated as such as well. Enter the era of psychology, where humanity began exploring how we are formed into adults. As it turned out, a lot of our adult selves, our fears, our neuroses, our hang-ups, they were developed in childhood. Thus, it became necessary, socially speaking, to separate the human developmental cycle into sections like infancy, toddlerhood, childhood, and adolescence. With the dual advent of psychology and modern philosophy, childhood became recognized as its own extremely important and formative era of human development. New theories from the likes of Sigmund Freud, John B. Watson, and Carl Jung tracked these developments, charting them for the first time in human history. The psychologists built their theories on foundations of modern philosophy, like that of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who in his book Emile initially described the three stages of development as infancy, childhood, and adolescence. We take these concepts for granted today, but in Rousseau's time they were forward-thinking, and soon educators adopted his philosophy all around the globe. It would take another 130 years for marketeers and advertisers to learn how to exploit these aspects of childhood development. But after World War II, the modern teenager was born, and teenagers liked horror and science fiction. Once the concept of teenagers became accepted as a cultural reality, shrewd business folk began to market to this crowd. Do you believe in ghosts? And then we got drive-ins and lots of teenage monsters. If we are products of our childhoods, then no wonder a child's point of view works so well in horror cinema. One of the first films to properly explore this was Curse of the Cat People, made in 1944 by directors Gunther von Fritsch and Robert Wise. It was a sequel to the 1942 horror hit Cat People. The 1942 film focuses on adult characters telling the story of a woman who believes she turns into a panther when romantically aroused. It is compelling, atmospheric stuff. The sequel, however, takes the perspective of its lead child character, focusing on said perspective in a new and highly psychological way. For the record, Curse of the Cat People hardly has anything to do with the previous entry in the series, aside from the title and the presence of actors Simone Simon, Jane Randolph, and Kent Smith repeating their turns from the first film. But as for the turning into a panther angle, that is practically absent from the sequel. Instead, Curse of the Cat People seeks to explore new territory, the fantasy life of a young girl. The story revolves around the daughter of the heroes of the first film. Her name is Amy. She is ostracized by other children. And to make her own life more interesting, she delves into a fantasy world of her own. Her father becomes angry about her reclusive state, worried it might seriously damage her entry into adulthood. But from Amy's perspective, she is far more interested in the mysterious apparitions of the long-since-deceased Simone Simon, the cursed Catwoman from the first film. Curse of the Cat People is a lyrical film whose psychological approach and perspective of childhood fantasy has influenced later cinema. We can see clear links in more recent masterpieces like Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth, but Curse of the Cat People remained an oddity in cinema history. We saw dramas like To Kill a Mockingbird and moody thrillers like Night of the Hunter adopt the perspective of children, but very few horror films did. The child's perspective only truly came alive in the horror genre at the tail end of the 1970s, with works from a pair of Stevens, the aforementioned King and the yet-to-be-mentioned Spielberg. What was it about the child's perspective that made the 1980s such a fruitful time for the genre? 
Perhaps it had to do with the coming of age of blockbusters, meaning that there were cultural reasons for the development. After a dreary period of hard-bitten yet often excellent 70s cinema, audiences cried out for more friendly entertainment. Star Wars and Jaws come to mind. The blockbuster era began, and in it many films were made to appeal to a large and wide audience. The new business model of Hollywood was films needed to appeal beyond one single target audience. Sure, you could make a brutal horror film that you could never take kids to. And you could make a children's film that would truly irritate unlucky adults chaperoning their kids. But the gold standard for 80s Hollywood filmmaking became those films that crossed demographics, rallying all audiences to the movies together. Oh, it's you. This had a funny side effect of allowing horror filmmakers access to children in a new way. Horror films could be made to appeal to kids, without the need of man-children as seen in Zombies on Broadway and the collective works of Abbott and Costello. This of course was sensible, as children had been the most ravenous consumers of horror and science fiction cinema since the monsters first appeared. It was just that they had rarely gotten films told from their own perspectives. But now, that was changing. Instead of adult heroes, children were invited to participate. The more this seemed to work for audiences, the more open financiers became to making horror films aimed at adults, but told from a child's perspective. This finally culminated in the runaway success of recent hits like It and Stranger Things. So what had changed? It wasn't just that filmmakers realized horror stories could become even more effective if we, the audience, experienced them through childlike eyes. But it was also that we had changed our approach to entertainment on a cultural level. I think it comes down to a generational shift. We are currently in an era where it is okay to be a nerd. It is okay to be childlike even as an adult. We are no longer overgrown clowns or parodies of people who could not grow up. Now we can love the things we loved as children while remaining high-functioning adults. This explains our love of the superhero genre, which was previously dismissed as juvenile, but now, today, it is one of the most important cultural expressions in cinema. This is certainly generational. And we came to this point around the same time kids who grew up watching home video and playing video games became middle-aged. We in this generation, and those that followed, allowed ourselves to take our childhood with us into adulthood. No wonder shows like Stranger Things and movies like It are so successful. We are no longer afraid of our childhoods. We allow ourselves to play more. We have finally crossed over completely from a time in history where childhood was just something you had to endure to get to adulthood. And we have entered into an era where we allow ourselves to remain childlike in several aspects of our grown-up cultural experience. But is this a bad thing or a good thing? I guess that depends on who you are as a person and how you approach life. The way I see it, if we as adults become so cynical that time flashes past us in an extreme rush because we become jaded by our own experiences, then I think it's a healthy development for us to retain a larger share of our childhood wonder. And yes, that includes our fears and our sense of mystery, what writer James A. G. once defined as the poetry and danger of childhood. I'd rather not have my life flash past me in an indomitable rush, without wonder, without poetry, or without danger. Because life is already too damn short. So see a film told from a child's perspective, and if you want to treat yourself, make it a horror film. Savor the experiences of the world, and thus, prolong your life. My name is Wolfcraft. This is History of Horror. If you enjoyed this episode, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. I'm also an author. My science fiction novel God of Desolation is available on Amazon, and my upcoming mystery novel Richly Drawn will be available on inkshares.com in late 2021. Check them out. And thanks a plenty. <laughs>